So bear with us, inshallah ta'ala, and let's see what we can uh, benefit from. Uh, first and foremost, Dr. Sab, thank you very much for uh, spending some of your precious time and agreeing to this uh, conversation. Uh, I want to ask, how are you? How are you doing? How's the family? I know that things have been very tense for you, and I know that a lot of people really, they just want to get an update about uh, what's going on. And, you know, we know you've been in self-imposed uh, exile, so we want to know from you, like, how's everything going? So, bismillah. Alhamdulillah, brother, grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah has been very kind, has been very merciful, has been very helpful. Though you may have heard about what happened in the last uh, uh, three years, uh, that the government of the country, you know, because of the allegations, was forced to shift out. And Hijra, which is the sunnah of the Prophet, Alhamdulillah. And with all these things, Alhamdulillah, by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but naturally my lifestyle and everything has changed. As you were in Bombay, we had one of the largest, mashallah, private organizations in the world. They were more than 500 full-time employees. And now I have only two employees, so it's a big change. And uh, everything, the way of working style, you know, previously more involved in hardcore dawa, based on compiled religion. So with all these things, mashallah, I feel that after shifting to Malaysia, you know, I've left my country uh, for more than three and a half years. You know, I feel that my iman has increased. And I personally feel that my closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has increased. The lifestyle has changed drastically and everything I feel is for the better. And I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looking at the situation of my country today. You know, my country planned what they planned to do to India. And one of their plans was to take me out of the country. I feel Allah planned better. As Allah says, Yam Quran Karam, Allah Khair Makhri. In Surah Imran chapter 3, verse number 54. Allah planned much better for me. My, my brother has increased. My iman has increased, my closeness to Allah has increased, the research has increased. Alhamdulillah, I'm sleeping about half an hour more than what I should sleep in Bombay. Bombay was about three, uh, three, three and a half hours, yet about three and a half hours to four hours. And Alhamdulillah, I feel overall with all the problems, etc., I think the positive point is much more, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, وَمَنْ يُهَاجِرْ فِي سَبِيلَ اللَّهِ يَرْجِفْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُرَاغَمًا كَثِيرًا وَسَعَرًا Whoever migrates for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he will find the earth very fertile and a lot of benefits and khair will come. And as we know, Dr. Sab, that uh, hijrah has been the sunnah of the anbiya. Ibrahim alayhi salam was the first to make a hijrah. And our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself made the hijrah. So you are following very noble footsteps. And we know that every hijrah that they made, it brought them much, much good for themselves and for the religion of Islam. So I pray that Allah Amen. subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you in this um, hijrah. And I pray that all of those Amen. blessings that the Quran mentions that will happen to those who immigrate for the sake of Allah and all the Inshallah. blessings of the muhajir because the muhajirin are of a higher status because of their hijrah. I pray that those blessings also come to you for your uh, hijrah and Allah brings comfort and peace to your um, family. But the question Amen. that arises, Dr. is why, why choose Malaysia? Because even I... When I heard, I was like, mashallah, there's so many countries, and I love Malaysia, but again, there must be some reason. So what, what is the reason that you chose the country of Malaysia? Well, the problem started in India about three and a half years back in July 2016. Within a couple of months, mashallah, there were about, you know, 13 to 15 countries that they offered me that I can come and stay there and you know, we'll take mm -hmm. care of you, we'll protect you, alhamdulillah. Seen the pros and cons, I shortlisted about three countries out of which I felt Malaysia was the best. And according to me today, after making the decision, I feel that, you know, almost all the countries, all the Muslim countries in the world are having problems. So I feel Malaysia is the best of the worst among the Muslim countries, or the best available Muslim country for a person to live in. And my reason are number one, that Malaysia is away from the war zone. You know, many of the Muslim countries are in the war zone, like, Yemen uh, and the Gulf countries and Egypt and Iraq and all. It's away from the water, number one. Number two, being in the Southeast Asia, it is away from the direct influence and the uh, direct bullying of the Western countries. Number two. And number three, that uh, um, uh, Malaysia is the strongest Muslim passport in the world. It's the country which has the strongest Muslim passport, where you can travel to 185 countries without any visa. U.S. may be, I think, two countries, but that's it. So Malaysia, 185 countries, you can travel without any visa, alhamdulillah. And lastly, amongst the non-Arab countries, among the non-Arab Muslim countries, I feel the practice of the Malaysian Muslim on average 
is higher than an average Muslim in India or average Muslim in Pakistan or Bangladesh on average. I feel that hmm. you find more number of percentage of Muslims offering the Salah in congregation in the mosque and practicing the deen. So all these factors put together, I felt, and Malaysia again, uh, point number five, is very economical. Compared to other countries like Gulf countries, or not, the cost of living is somewhat similar to India. And lastly, point number six, it's a very, it's a very beautiful country in terms of scenery. And, and, and even everything else is much, much more economical. And even traveling there, you find that a large number of tourists come to Malaysia. So these seven factors put together, and especially Putrajaya. I feel Putrajaya is one of the best Muslim cities in the world for a Muslim to live in. Because here, yeah, mashallah, there's no alcohol, there's no, mm -hmm. there's no nightlife, there's no dance clubs, and you know, there's no pork. So all this put together, I felt Putrajaya is one of the best cities in the world where a, where a Muslim can live, practice, alhamdulillah. Islam. Mm -hmm. Alhamdulillah. So I just visited Malaysia, Rukhsab. Uh, we met each other a few months ago. We had no idea this lockdown would happen. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I've been to Malaysia uh, three or four times. And uh, may I add here that I have found also the Malay people to be very humble, very sweet, very good akhlaq. And uh, subhanAllah, and um, one of the things that I, I said when I went to Malaysia is that in most Muslim countries in the world, uh, the, 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 the armies of Islam came and then Islam spread after that. But Malaysia is one of the few places that Islam spread organically. And the majority of its inhabitants uh, are Muslim, despite the fact that, you know, there was no ghazwa, you know, from the time of the Umayyads or the Sahaba. So this is, inshallah, something that they can use to their um, advantage. Uh, so, and of, uh, for the uh, listeners as well, Putrajaya is a new city that is around an hour or 40 minutes away from half, Kuala Lumpur. Half an hour. It's a, half an hour. On average. Half an hour away. And it is, it's what? On average. Some parts are much more close. On average. Some yeah. Dep and depends oh, the on the traffic as well. Because Malaysia does have some traffic, you know, but Putrajaya is a, is a purpose-built city that was meant to be a capital uh, for the, where they can run the, the administrative country from. Of the country. Administrative, yes, it's an administrative capital, yeah. And it's a, a beautiful city, mashallah, as Draksab said, that uh, there's so many pros over there, alhamdulillah. Uh, so Draksab, I mentioned we met uh, recently, I think it was just three months ago, seems like so long Second ago. And subhanAllah, we had a very nice uh, conversation. We spent the day together. And I just made a post with your permission uh, about uh, our conversation. Uh, and I mentioned in it that, you know, the, the BJP uh, government offered you um, uh, uh, um, uh, security if you're going to change your tone and if you were to uh, praise them. And I just mentioned it as a part of many points. And I had no idea that that post would actually become a political incident and the media would, would uh, you know, jump on it. And it actually became much bigger than what it was just a post about our nice meeting and great time. And one of the things, just one point, was this issue of the BJP government making you an offer. So it's interesting how that post went viral and how it be created a media sandstorm and sensation. What are your thoughts about that? And do you have anything to add about the, the BJP um, controversy with you in particular before we get to the... Actually, as was mentioned in the post and, and in my short uh, clarification for about five minutes, that uh, uh, the Prime Minister of uh, India, Narendra Modi, and the Home Minister of India, uh, they had sent an envoy under the direct instruction to meet me in the last week of September. And they told me that, you know, we would like to uh, give you a safe passage to India and, and we will see to it that all the problem is solved. And I asked them, what do you want? And, uh, and I said, as long as you don't ask me to do anything against the Quran, against the Sunnah, and I don't want your money, and if it benefits the Muslim Ummah, I've got no problem cooperating with you. But I realized that they, want me, they wanted me to support them in the issue of the abrogation of the Article 317 in Kashmir, they wanted me to support them about the NAC Act and various things, which, but naturally I declined. And this wasn't made public. And I spoke to very few people, one of them was you. And when you said, and I mentioned, I said, I didn't have intention of making it public, but I said, no problem. And when your post came, there was only one newspaper that reported it. But what clicked the thing is that the Indian authorities forced me to say, that deny what Sheikh Yasser Khadmi is saying. I said, this I cannot do. So when the pressure increased on me, then I gave a press release, as well as a short video of five minutes clarifying the issue. 
and saying about the background, which went viral. And, and I literally counted more than 100 newspapers, media and media outlets, mainly in India and all over the world, they covered this event. And it went viral. And even the short video has more than a million views, alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. So I want the viewers to understand how precarious the situation is that it wasn't even meant to cause any issue. I'm just reporting on our conversation with Dr. Saha's permission. And the government doubled down and wanted him to withdraw and say that that never happened. And it must be said here, it's so, uh, it, it betrays the reality of this organization and this entity that is ruling the, the, the country in a way that is so clear. They know, Dr. Saab, that you are not a terrorist. They know that you are not an actual threat. And they're willing for you to come back into the country, give you all your assets back, give you your citizenship rights back, if you praise them and you sing their tune. And again, it's not nice to praise somebody in front of uh, their face, but I ask your forgiveness when I tell the audience that, inshallah, this is the sign of a true iman and courage, that when you're offered the dunya, when you're offered a magnificent platter full of goods, and you're asked to compromise on your deen, and you say, no, thank you, I cannot do that, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then inshallah, Allah will give you much more than what has been taken away from you. You know, our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, whoever gives up what he wants for the sake of Allah, Allah will give him more than what he gave up. So we firmly believe, Dr. Sahib, and make dua in front of all of our viewers, and make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you infinitely more Amen. than what Amen. you have had to give up. Amen. And uh, I know, Dr. Sahib, that right now you are having... Um, uh, some issues as well uh, politically. So, uh, to just to clarify, your citizenship wise, you don't have any other citizenship, correct? Not yet. There are many countries that have offered me, and I can take when I want. But so far, I've not taken. Exactly. So, this makes it even more difficult that the one citizenship that you have, the government is willing that you come back, you get it renewed, because right now the passport will not you know, be renewed as if it stands as it is. So, the fact that you turn them down, inshallah, it speaks volumes about your own uh, sincerity and ask Allah to give you and me uh, sincerity and to bless uh, and accept from us. Alhamdulillah. Uh, also want to say, Dr. Saab, that uh, we we're having a conversation a few days ago and you mentioned that after our meeting, uh, you, it formed a catalyst or it acted as a catalyst that uh, uh, you became more active on Facebook. Can you clarify to the viewership uh, about that? Uh, small? Actually, normally, if you know, in the past, I doubt anyone has rarely seen me on a live program on the social media like what we're having now. Uh, the reason was that though I've been receiving many invitations uh, for live talks or shows or conferences on the internet, the reason is that I myself, in the year 2016, there were more than 5,000 invitations pending only for physical life lectures from outside India. More than 5,000, which I could not attend, those which I did not attend, and every year it was increasing. Because every day we receive a few invitations and I cannot entertain all. So that is the reason as a policy, we, we had a policy that we, I will not have any programs on the internet. Because if I start that, there will be tens of thousands of requests. So as a policy, and this I remember maybe in my full life, in my full life of about more than 25 years of Dawa, and more than 20 years of the internet is there, I, I may have spoken maybe four times. Or maybe five times on the internet, that's it. Only four or five times in my full life. And this is maybe the sixth time. I'm talking about live program as an interview. If my live lecture is me telecast, that's different. And the reason was that once if I open the Pandora's box, it is difficult for me to... And that's what exactly happened. The moment I gave a green signal to you, maybe about two, three weeks back, every day I started receiving requests. Not that the new I said yes to you, but then... I only agreed with two more, and then I put a stop. I said, I go back to old policy. Because my staff were after me since many years, and even now, that on my Facebook, mashallah, when there are more than 22 million followers, why don't I do live shows weekly? And because of my busy schedule and other, you know, uh, other commitments, and I'm sleeping hardly three and a half hours a day. So then when I told yes to you, then my wife caught me, and she said, okay, now, alas, now you have to give commitment. And she forced me. To give a commitment of appearing twice a week for Ramadan. And that's how yesterday we sent a post that inshallah I will come on my Facebook live for one and a half hour, inshallah, twice a week. 
uh, in the month of Ramadan on Tuesdays and Saturdays. And after Ramadan, inshallah, I will continue once a week on Saturday, maybe for two hours a week, inshallah. MashaAllah. So, we thank so, Mahabi for forcing. So I would like to thank Allah for you for two things. One thing for the issue what happened uh, three months back. And even this, that, you know, uh, may Allah bless you, that it was pending since a long time. And because of you, you know, you are the catalyst. And Alhamdulillah, because of you, inshallah, you'll get the sawab in Jaria for both these. Uh, inshallah. In inshallah. Jazakallah khair, man. Jazakallah khair. But all, all of this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the and reason, also, I'm sorry, the reason I... Allah, because she's the one who uh, requested it. And also, this is a, a message to all of the husbands out there that even Dr. Zakir Naik and myself, when, when our missus says something, Samir and Awatan, we obey them. That is the sign of a happy marriage. Alhamdulillah. No, she's the most alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And she's the most alhamdulillah. 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 So, Dr. Sab, uh, what's uh, so as you know, I mean, we have uh, our viewership also knows this that um, we've had a uh, a good relationship for almost, I think, 15 years now. Uh, the Peace TV, Peace Conferences, I used to attend back in mid 2000s. Yes, 2007 was the first conferences. time we met. 2007 we met, yes. I think, in the first time. So this is the 14, yes, this. approximately 14 years, Alhamdulillah. 14 years, exactly. And Alhamdulillah, I've rec uh, recorded a whole Sira and other programs Mashallah. as well. Mashallah. But what is the status of Peace TV now? And what is the future plans that Peace TV has? And also your personal future plans now that we don't, you know, you're, you're disconnected from India and uh, your base in, in uh, Mumbai. So, As you are aware, Alhamdulillah, that Peace TV, Mashallah, was the largest religious washed satellite channel in the world. Not only Sami channel but a satellite channel. And according to the survey we did viewership of Peace TV Network, as you are with the Peace TV Network has got uh, satellites in four different languages, English, Urdu, Bangla, and Chinese. English in the year 2016, it was uh, broadcast on 15 different satellites, mashallah. Having a potential viewership of about one and a half to two billion people. Potential viewership means it is entering the home, the house, they may watch, they may not watch. But the actual viewership of Peace TV English approximately was about 100 million. Peace TV Urdu was approximately 80 million. Peace TV Bangla was 50 million and Chinese about 20 million. All put together was more than 200 million. Actual viewers, alhamdulillah. And as you know that after the internet is getting more popular, the social media is getting more popular. And everyone asked me the question that, you know, isn't social media, hasn't social media overtaken uh, the satellite? And I told them in 2016 that not yet, it will in the near future. As for the statistics of the end of January 2020, approximately 59.8% of the population of the world, they use internet. And about 49.8% use social media. You know, that's more than 4.5 billion people use the internet. And about 3.8 billion people they use social media. And number one on the social media is the Facebook which has active monthly viewers of two and a half billion. It's number one in the world. Number two uh, would be uh, the YouTube, which has two billion uh, monthly active users, followed by, followed by WhatsApp, which is 1.8 billion. Then you have the Instagram, more than 1 billion. And then you have the Twitter, about 600 million. And uh, uh, then you have the Tumblr, the Pinterest, and Snapshot, so on and so forth. So what has happened that in 2016, yet I believe that the satellite was much higher than the social media. Now, the gap is decreasing. Now, I feel that the reach of the social media is someone at par with the satellite. And what happened in India, you know, that our base was in India, actually. And our headquarters was in India. Where in Bombay alone, we had, mashallah, more than 500 full-time paid employees, only in Bombay. Then outside Bombay, other cities, we had more than 100. And our staff outside India in other countries was another 30, 40, mashallah. So all put together, we had uh, more than 600 uh, full-time paid employees. And uh, our main production studio of Peace TV in Bombay had 300 full-time paid employees. And the volunteers, mashallah, of the organization were more than 10,000 alone, mashallah. So now, because of the change in the scenario, you know that there has been a financial crunch in the world. You know, it came in 2015, then 16, 17, and COVID-19 as, you know. So all this put together, the financial structure has changed. And after shifting to Bombay, what has happened in Bombay, because our main focus, my main focus was Peace TV, I used to, on average, 
on my Facebook, I used to hardly give half an hour a month. That is six hours a year. All social media put together, I used to spend about one hour a month, for 12 hours a year. When I shifted to Malaysia, and I got settled you know, in 2017 and then 18, I started giving only for the social media about five hours a day. You know, the whole thing has changed, and satellite became less because the production has reduced. In the last two weeks, I've been giving about maybe 15, 16 hours a day for the social media. Why? Because we were only on basically three platforms before. On Facebook, YouTube, and our website. Our website was, uh, we had to close our website because it was registered under the organization. So for legal purposes, in 2016, we had to close our website. At that time, the IRF.net was the fourth largest visited Islamic website in the world. The first being Islam q &A. But then we had to close it. Now we decided, okay, let's, let's restart it. For the last two, three weeks, I've been at it. And inshallah, if Allah wills, day after tomorrow, during Ramadan first, we'll be launching the website again. And it is completely different than what it was before. It is much more informative. It is much more voluminous. That website wasn't that much, but yet it was popular. So, inshallah, we are looking forward to it. And once it is launched, the main structure would be ready. But every day we'll be uploading things like lecture script, videos. So all the activities put together. If you're on Facebook, everything will be on the website. If you're on my videos, we'll be on the website. Pinterest will be on the website. So we are giving more time to the social media. So my focus has shifted more to social media. And just a week or two weeks before, we launched Instagram, which is the second most famous in terms of after uh, Facebook, in terms of posting uh, social media, it's the second most, not counting the YouTube and the WhatsApp. So we launched on the Instagram. We're having problems because you know that there are already more than 50 fake accounts on Instagram, more than 100, 200 fake accounts of mine on the Facebook, on all the social media. So when we launched, we're having a problem that our name is coming last because it is new. And it's, <laughs> so other than I thought to be more authentic. So inshallah, we'll catch up soon. And so we have shifted our focus more on the social media. The production of satellite has, has gone down. And in India, it was mainly my activity. I mean, I've given my life for this. It was more than 50% more hardcore competitive in the DAO activity. Mm. Shifting to Malaysia, that comparative has reduced a little bit, has gone more to the other problem of the Muslim Ummah, which is not directly related to DAO. And I'm in interaction with more scholars than what I was before, the Islamic scholars, the Islamic du'as. So the whole uh, type of activity has shifted. And, and Allah accepts whatever we are doing. I believe that whatever activity you are doing, as long as you strive, Allah, I believe that whatever little bit we have achieved, we cannot achieve on our own at all. Everything, 100% is because of the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I cannot imagine that a person who is to stammer, there are such a large audience coming for my talk, it's not possible at all. It's impossible. It's a miracle. It's only because of the niyama of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that people come for my talk. On my Facebook, I wonder that how come 22 million followers, it is unbelievable. It's a dream. It's not possible. And you know that with 22 million followers, if we make it, commercialize it, you can earn Millions of dollars in a, in a year. Millions. We know that. But we have not made any of our social media commercialized, neither Peach TV, because we believe that we want more swap and a bigger reach. Mm -hmm. So now we are focusing more on the social media and the other aspects of the Muslim Ummah rather than what we used to do in, in Bombay. Mm -hmm. And we like accept our efforts in a day. Alhamdulillah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, Inna ladina amanu wa amanu salihati sayaj'alu lahum rahmanu wudda. And what this means is that those who do good deeds and those who are righteous, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write love for them. And our commentators say that one of the signs of sincerity and one of the signs of piety is that love is written for the servants of Allah amongst the hearts of the servants of Allah. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants all of us that sincerity because with that sincerity comes the barakah. There is no barakah, there is no blessings from Allah without sincerity. So we make, uh, we, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you sincerity, me sincerity and all of our viewers sincerity. And inshallah it is a sign. The very fact that so many people uh, admire and respect a uh, 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 Muslim and the, and the righteous look up to this, inshallah it is a sign. And we ask Allah to maintain all of us in that positive 
uh, until we die and in the future Amen. as well, inshallah ta'ala. Dr. Saab, I need to ask you a very uh, difficult question, but it is troubling to many of our viewers. And that is the situation of Muslims in uh, India. And as you know, Dr. Saab, that my grandparents are from India. I have Indian blood. I still have relatives in India. But even if we didn't, we are all one ummah. And to see how the Muslims are being treated, and especially to see uh, the current party uh, making uh, Islamophobia one of its core elements. And the most bizarre thing is to then claim that Muslims are behind this COVID crisis and somehow, you know, link Islam and Muslims with this COVID crisis. It's very worrying, Dr. Saab. And I, I want to ask you, as somebody who's obviously much more knowledgeable than me in Indian politics and, and the reality of, of the Indian situation, what we are seeing, the BJP is becoming more Sorry, stronger Sheikh. and their base is becoming even more radicalized. I cannot so hear you. What do you see the future? Yeah, Dr. Saab, can you hear me? Okay, we have a lag in the um, in the internet time, but inshallah, let's see if we can get him back, inshallah. Yeah. Sorry, Sheikh, I cannot hear you. Okay, can you hear me now? Sorry, Sheikh. Sorry, Sheikh, I cannot hear you. There's a poor connection. Okay. So from our side, the connection is... Yeah, from our side, we are good here. Uh, the connection is... A, can you hear me now, Dr. <laughs> Okay, now I can hear you. Yes, now I can okay, hear you. so the question was the question was about the future of Muslims in India and the reality of the BJP using Islam as linking it to the COVID crisis. What is your analysis? Of this? Number one, let me tell you that I generally believe that as a whole, the Hindus in India and the non-Muslims in India, they aren't against Muslims as a whole. I believe amongst the Hindu maybe approximately 75 to 80% of the population of India, uh, that before BJP government came to power, according to me, maybe 5% of the Hindus would be against Muslims. And about 15% of the Hindus would go out of the way to help the Muslims. And the balanced 80% were neutral. They were good human beings. There were no problem between Hindus and Muslims. But later on, because of the political situation, Situation, they felt that we can use religion as the trump card to come to power. BJP said they started using that and they started propagating animosity against the Muslims to come to power. And with that, maybe the percentage of the Hindus against Muslims may have increased to 10%. But because of the fear psychosis, the people supporting Muslims has reduced to 5%. And the neutral is 85%. As time is going on, because of the threat they are giving on the social media and the open lynching of the, of the Muslims and giving a clear-cut picture to the Hindus that if you support Muslims, we will attack you. So they have been attacking those Hindus who are supporting Muslims. Because of that, the people openly supporting Muslims have reduced. And those who were there, who were neutral, so now I would feel that after they have come to power, the second time, the people against Muslims may be approximately 15%, 5% in favor, and yet 80% neutral. But these 80% neutral, they're afraid of showing that they're neutral because they're afraid of the government. So because when, when the BJP came to power the second time, first time they came in 2014, and they came with an open agenda that they're going to attack the Muslims, and to hide the negative factors that they have in India, they bring up the issue of war with Pakistan, or the Muslim issue, about the Babi Masjid, about the Kashmir issue, about the Tipil Talaq. What has Tipil Talaq got to do with the economy of the country? So they so they're bringing these issues to show to the non-Muslims that you know these are the problematic areas, and they can solve the problem of Babi Masjid. Even now, when the court gave a verdict in favor, they are not building the temple. Why? They will do it close to the next election. So every time they want to make an issue, and now, so I believe that the Muslims should be united, which we aren't, that's the situation. As far as the basic hmm. question that what is the response as far as COVID-19 is concerned, now they are using COVID-19 also as an issue to attack the Muslims. They are saying 
of COVID-19 to enter into India are the Muslims. And there are many examples. They are blaming and they are saying that the gathering that happened in Delhi, 4,000 people of the Tablik Jamaat, you know, it's one of the largest Sunni Muslim gathering that takes place throughout the world without any publicity, without any media. They gather in large numbers in different parts of the world. So, according, according to the fact, when they had that gathering, they had all the police permissions. So, that gathering wasn't illegal at all. So, it is wrong to blame them because if they did not take permission, then you can hold them responsible. So, the public Jamaat, when they had the gathering in mind, they did not break any law. But what happened when the gathering of few days got over, Immediately, without any notice, the government announced that there's going to be a lockdown next day. So the people who had gathered from different parts of the country and outside India, they tried to go back home to the city. They could not. So many of them came back to the Markas. And when they came back to the Markas, the government said, now you're breaking the law that during lockdown, how can a few hundred people or a thousand people gather there? which is totally wrong. I mean, they did not do it willingly. It was without any warning. Furthermore, what the news is saying that majority of the cases of the Tablik Jamaat is from COVID-19. The fact is that there are other news available that majority of the people, there was hardly anyone who was tested positive. So the news, the whole news media of India, the mainstream media, except for one channel, NDTV, the majority of the mainstream media has been purchased by the government. Either it's owned by the BGP government, or they are friends of BGP government, or they are bought over by BGP government. So much so that you will be shocked to know, one of the biggest fake news of COVID-19 in India was, one of the leading popular channels of India, Z News, they gave a breaking news saying, the main person responsible for spreading COVID-19 in India is Dr. Zakir Naik. He is he, he picked up Malaysian Tablik Jamaatis, Malaysian Muslim from Tablik Jamaat, and he put COVID-19 in them and told them to go to India. And how can a logical person in his wildest dream, so this is the biggest fake news in India, that the main person responsible for spreading COVID-19 in India is Dr. Nakinak and by Z News, which is one of the leading news channels in India. You see, it's, 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 it's very disheartening that, you know, Muslims are, there are many hospitals in India, owned by Hindus, they said Muslim cannot be treated in hospital. Subhanallah. Then there are cases where, like in Delhi and some cities in India, that Muslims aren't allowed to sell their stuff in the market. And when there were some Muslim vendors who sold their vegetables, these hooligans, they came and they forced the people who bought the vegetables to give it back. And they hunted these Muslims out. So there are so many things. There's open lynching. There, there's open. They fail to realize that, do you know, that the company, the medical pharmaceutical company, which has been deputed by the Indian government to prepare vaccine for COVID-19 is owned by a Muslim. The second company, which is doing the best to find treatment, is a Wokhan, again owned by a Muslim. The person who gave one of the largest donations to India to fight COVID-19, as in by Premier Muslim. So, if you really, so you, so what you realize, that it is mainly a media hype, it is mainly, it is promoted by the government, such things, which is absurd, it is inhuman, it is against the constitution, and, the, and what they're saying, I mean, I can keep on speaking for hours, I don't want to do that, but they said, it is Corona Jihad. Not coronavirus, Corona Jihad, these Muslims, they are responsible for spreading uh, the COVID-19 coronavirus in India and they're saying Corona Jihad. So may Allah save us from all this fitna that's being done by the anti-Muslims. I mean, and you know, Dr. the problem comes that uh, it's almost impossible to argue with somebody who believes this because it is so illogical, it is so against rationality and common sense, the people who believe it cannot be approached with rationality and common sense. Um, and uh, Dr. Sahib, can you hear me now? Okay, uh, do we have a connection? Can, we have, can you hear me now, Dr. Sahib? Okay, how about now? This happens in uh, Skype meetings, testing, testing, one, two, three, <laughs> around the globe, we're having these, these issues. 
Yeah, from our side, we are all okay. Can you hear me now, Dr. Sab? We can hear you, Dr. Sab, but... Uh, I cannot hear you, Sheikh. I don't think... I mean, the connection is poor. You cannot hear, still. I can just hear you. Okay. No, Sheikh, I can hear you in sports only. Not clearly. No, no. Okay. But we can hear you, by the way, if, uh, absolutely fine. So uh, we can hear you. Let me see if we can... I cannot hear you, sir. So we want you to answer, um, I cannot answer, but I can speak. Okay, well, we, um, so let me just explain a little bit as well from our side is that um, what Dr. Saab said about India is actually uh, applying around the world. And uh, here in America, unfortunately, even our own president and members of the administration have also be begun linking Islam or somehow bringing in Islam or using their far right agenda and linking it with Islam. So, for example, Three days ago, the president retweeted uh, a very far-right Islamophobe uh, saying that, you know, you're telling us to shut the churches down. I wonder, are you going to do the same thing with the masjids or not? Are you going to shut the mosques down or not? And of course, America is 1% Muslim. That's a very small minority of us here is, is Muslim. And there is no issue. Alhamdulillah, almost all of our masjids have voluntarily shut down. So this is a false fear that is being created. The president retweeted this, that there's a double standard between between churches and mosques, and there is no double standard. Yesterday, the president announced that because of the COVID crisis, we're going to ban all immigration. And of course, this is catering to his far right base where this, these xenophobic parties across the country in India, in Israel, in America, in Brazil, you have the rise of these nativistic, we call them parties, parties that are mixing a hybrid of fanaticism and racism and their versions of religion. And they're using them to uh, foment their own base to, so that they become more popular. And in all of these countries and more, Muslims and Islam becomes the target. We become the evil person that they're now creating and fomenting their own uh, political ambitions via being against uh, Muslims. And unfortunately, we're even seeing this uh, across the country. I know that even in the Middle East, there's some issues taking place uh, uh, in this regard. Do you have any comments about that, Dr. Sab, that the rise of Islamophobia and linking it to the... Yes, I do agree with you that it is happening throughout the world. More in India, what's happening in USA, happening in UK, even in UK. And as far as the Gulf country is concerned, you may be aware that... All the gun country, the maximum foreigners that are there in the country that I live in all all this is country, uh, all this is Gulf country. And out of the Indians that are there in the Gulf country, approximately 50% are Muslims, 50% are Muslims. And for your information, the maximum revenue, the maximum foreign exchange that comes into India is from the Gulf country, 50%. Every month, more than one billion dollars is transferred from UAE. To India officially, more than one billion dollar a month is transferred from you, uh, from only from Saudi Arabia to India officially. Unofficially, the amount may be bigger. Only from the Gulf countries in India, every year fifty-five billion dollar comes in. Only from the expatriates, and that is about fifty uh, percent of the of the foreign uh, revenue of India comes from Gulf country and all Muslim countries put together, it is more than sixty percent. The problem is that, according to me, there has been a negative uh, comments by the non-Muslims of India and the Gulf countries since ages. But yeah. in this COVID-19, it has hit epidemic levels. And you have find large-scale people in all the Gulf countries, especially in UAE, in Saudi, in Kuwait, they have started speaking against Muslims and criticizing them, abusing them. What has happened, Alhamdulillah, a good thing after a long time, our brothers, mashallah, in the Middle East, they woke up. And we have many people from the Gulf countries who are objecting to this Islamophobic attack, to the maligning of the Prophet, of Islam, of the Muslims. So much so that, mashallah, you had from the royal family in Sharjah, in UAE, that's the princess, Hind al Qasmi, she objected. There were many other people from UAE objected, from Kuwait, from Qatar. Uh, you know, very famous uh, uh, scholar, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Zarani, a very famous lawyer from, uh, from, uh, from Kuwait, said that we should file case against these Indians living in the Gulf country who speak against Islam. And he said that all those who have information about non-Muslims, Indian, in Gulf countries attacking Islam, please let me know. 
will look at them. He went to the extent of filing a case in Geneva in the human rights against these people. But I, I would like to give an advice that they should go a step further. There are many of the non-Muslim Hindus from UAE who have been sent back to India and from other Gulf countries. I would like to add and request them that not only they should take into account all the non-Muslim Indians living in the Gulf country attacking Islam, they should even keep a track record of all the non-Muslim Indians in India who are attacking Islam and keep that data with them because most of these rich non-Muslim Indians often travel to the Gulf countries. Many of them, they travel to different Muslim countries of the world. And many Muslim countries of the world are tourist spots, whether it be Malaysia, Turkey, the Gulf countries, Dubai. If they have a record with that, and if they know that they're criticizing the religion of Islam and actually spreading venom and communal disharmony, it is by the law of all the countries, Muslim countries, you cannot do that. So if they have a data and they make it very evident that if these people who have openly criticized and spread communal disharmony, if they come to our country, we will arrest them. That would be a step further so that the non-Muslims in India, they know that they travel to Muslim countries. And if they openly criticize in the, not criticize, actually abuse, abuse the Prophet, abuse Islam, openly without any reason, without any logic. So if they make it very popular that or the OIC, that we will have a record of these non-Muslims who are openly abusing Islam. Once they enter any Muslim country, they should be arrested. That would be what would cause a difference in the impact of the Islamophobia and attack, attacking Islam. Allah is commanding Muslims who do not believe in idolatry. We are very critical of idolatry. Allah says, don't curse the false gods and their idols. Don't say vulgarities because in response, they're just going to utter vulgarities. You see, as you know, Dr. Saab, debating is allowed. You can have a good conversation. They're allowed to hold beliefs that are contrary to Islam. But bringing in vulgarities, bring, being mean and nasty, simply being rude for the sake of being rude, uh, uttering uh, evil things about Allah and His Messenger just to hurt other people's feelings. This is not even in our religion we are told, even if you don't believe in their gods, don't curse their gods, don't say vulgarities about their gods. And subhanAllah, what you say is absolutely right, that there is no doubt that those who say vulgarities about our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, why should they be coming to uh, the lands where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is uh, respected? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sab, we're coming to the end of our program. Uh, can you hear me now? We have one question left. Can you hear me now, Dr. Sab? No, I can only hear you okay. just a couple of words in the sentence. Okay, so the, the last uh, question that we have, and I have some stuff to say as well, if you cannot hear me in the meantime, and that is um, right, now can we're facing the rise of agnosticism, the rise of atheism. This is our final question, Dr. Saab. We're facing the rise of agnosticism and atheism uh, amongst uh, some segments of uh, the Muslim uh, ummah, especially here in America. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit about that before we conclude, because I think it's very important that people hear from the both of us. What do we think we should be doing? What advice can we give to the Muslims to make sure that we protect the iman of the next generation and to counter this rise of irreligiosity and agnosticism and atheism? As far as the rise of atheism rising in the Western country, I disagree with you. It is not only uh, only Western country throughout the world. It is rising everywhere in the world, including Gulf countries. You know where I consider that, you know, the Gulf country, especially Saudi Arabia, is the heart of Fahid. I was shocked. It was in 2014. They asked me to give a lecture on atheism. Does God exist? I was shocked. In Saudi Arabia, in Jamit al-Imam, where I consider one of, the, one, of the, one of the best Islamic universities, to give a talk on atheism. And then I realized that the people told me that even in the Gulf countries, leave aside Western countries, leave aside UK, leave aside America, India, even there, there are, and previously, previously, according to me, when, an, when a person from Saudi Arabia or from the Gulf country went to America or went to Western countries, the chances that you know, they would deviate from the deen would be maybe one or two percent. That's it. But nowadays, the chances are more than 25%. Coming back to your question, I know that there is a rise, and I've given a talk on this topic, does God exist? 
where I have proved with with reason, logic, and science like this Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. What I believe that amongst the people who in the past, you know, there is a section of the of the guys who who disagree on answering any question, which which I don't agree with them. They say, okay, this question, yeah, shaitani sawale. This is a, a devil's question. So this quite this question cannot be asked. You know, so they disagree on answering question when anyone raises against the Quran. Well, I'm concerned if I find a book which is written against the Quran and a book written in favor of Quran, I will first buy buy the book written against the Quran to know how are they attacking the Quran. If I don't know how the enemy is attacking the Quran, huh? How as a die can I defend it? So what we realize that many questions like which our younger generation asks, our older generation used to disagree replying. Saying that this will take away from the deed, which I disagree. Number one, we should stop saying "do not answer" questions which are, which are you know, a certain question. I said no, you can answer any question. Yes, a question can be illogical. Fine, but we cannot say that if it's any question. Like someone says, "Why don't you have pork?" or anything. If they ask any question, it cannot be a question which cannot be asked. That's a different question that everyone is not specialized in the field. Of answering the atheist, one thing is we should encourage questions. Let it be anything under the sun, but everyone is not specialized in replying. Because while if you are not specialized, you may falter and break the principles of Islam while replying. So I know many guys while replying to the non-Muslims, they go overboard and they go against the principles of the Quran. They go against the verses of the Quran. They go against the Hadith unknowingly, unintentionally. So that's a big problem. Number two. There were some duaats who fully like science. Science is ultimate means science is on top of the world, and they used to speak. Oh yes, we have many. Those same duaats today say don't speak about science. But the last time you see them, why are going to extreme? Yes, science. We have to respect science. We agree with science, but not everything can you prove scientifically. So I believe that science is a very good tool. There are many guys who say science should not be used, which I disagree with. Science is a very good tool for spreading the deen among the atheists, because for the atheists today, science and logic is the ultimate, uh, you could say, uh, ultimate yardstick. So we cannot neglect science. What we should do is that many of the things within the Muslim ummah, which because of preconceived wrong ideas, we think about science, which is not going against the Quran. It's not going against the Hadith. It's not going against the Sharia. But we have a preconceived idea that this is against Sharia. And when science says something against it, we defend it. Rather, we should look at it that is, is this what a Sharia says? So, if we go to the extent of using logic, science, and reasoning, inshallah, I feel it is not difficult at all to convince the atheist. As far as I'm concerned, mm. Alhamdulillah. I have spoken to hundreds and thousands of atheists, mashallah. And if we stick to our rules, that Quran is ultimate, the Sharia is ultimate. Alhamdulillah, mm. use reason and logic. And how can we convince them? So, in my lecture, does God exist? In one section, I've used Quran and science to prove the existence of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In the other section, I've used logic. And third section, what will happen if Allah is not there? If God is not there? So, using all these logic, I feel if an Unbiased non-Muslim hears this lecture or the convincing reply. I feel if he is open-minded and unbiased, he has to come to the truth of Islam. So, Zakalah, adding to this as well, I just want all of these points are great. I wanted to add some points as well that I think one of the things that Dr. Sab says is very true, and that is that when our young come to us, when our youth come to us with deep questions. A lot of times we just shut them off. A lot of times we don't allow them to even verbalize those questions. That is a mistake, especially in the current climate that we live in. Now, if you are not qualified to answer, go to somebody who is qualified to answer. But if your son or daughter comes to you and asks a very difficult question, maybe if you were a child and asked it, maybe your mother or father would have smacked you or said, be quiet, how dare you? Okay, we cannot do that anymore. Because if you don't answer, somebody else is going to answer in an incorrect way. So take your son or daughter to somebody who can answer. Also, uh, adding to this as well is that uh, agnosticism and atheism is also a spiritual disease. It's not just, as Dr. Saab said, very valid point, logic and reason. Also, there's a spiritual element. And therefore, as you respond to these questions, 
perhaps as well make sure you emphasize the spirituality that is needed to be a good holistic human being because science and reason only take you so far the human soul also needs some ibadah some uh, ta'alluq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and science can never give you that purpose in life science and, and, and rationality can never give you the spiritual feeling of happiness that comes when you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the fitrah that Allah created us upon it needs as well some spirituality so in tackling these issues of agnosticism and atheism, we have multi-pronged approaches. We take science and rationality, we take logic and reason, we obviously take the Quran and Sunnah, and we also bring in the element of spirituality. And inshallah, those that are sincere, and that's the big if, if they are sincere, then inshallah they will definitely come back to the faith because you cannot be uh, an atheist if you're fully logical and rational and also if you understand the needs of the soul. The, the atheist is somebody who is insisting on that which you cannot insist on reason and logic and the atheist as well is insisting on covering the needs of his or her own soul. Their soul is crying for some meaning, for some life, for some purpose, for some ibadah. And the atheist is insisting, no, I'm not going to answer to what is needed. And that is why the term kufr actually means to cover up. Because the atheist has in fact forced the covering on his or her own soul. And that's why it's important that we uh, deal with this in a uh, holistic manner. Uh, Dr. Mashallah, we spent an entire hour together. Uh, Jazakallah khair for your time. Any parting comments uh, about uh, Ramadan, about any issues? What is the parting advice that you want to uh, leave us with? My advice would be that because of the different situation that we are in today, most of the parts of the world is in lockdown. My advice would be let this isolation get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The other advice is that the common term used very often in the media and by the Muslims also is social distancing. I would consider that social distancing in Islam is haram. The right word and the more appropriate word is physical distancing. So even many of the dais in, oh, it's, no, it's a requirement of social distancing. Social distancing is a major sin. You know, you cannot stay away from your loved one. Yes, the thing is physical distancing, if there's a requirement, should be done. So not to use these words which are un-Islamic. And let this isolation get you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be in this time, it's difficult to do ithikaf because one of the reasons, one of the requirements for ithikaf is the mosque. And most of the mosques are closed down. So let us, when we are isolated in the home, let us come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let us, let us contemplate and let us do more good deeds. And let this month of Ramadan, which is starting from, from tomorrow, in here in Malaysia, there is hardly about uh, 20 hours, less than 20 hours left in Malaysia, uh, about, about 19 hours for Ramadan, and in your part of the world, maybe more than a day is left. So, inshallah, we pray and we're looking forward to this Ramadan, and let this Ramadan get us closer to Allah, let our Iman increase, and let our Taqwa also increase. Inshallah, and again to... Um, uh, reiterate that point that this is potentially the best Ramadan we will ever have in our lives because we will be minimizing uh, uh, our uh, issues of going to different houses for iftar, uh, traveling in traffic, whatnot. We are going to be in our houses, quarantined up. We have extra time for ibadah, extra time for Quran, extra time for dhikr, extra time for contemplation. It is as if the whole month of Ramadan is a semi-i'tikaf, not a full i'tikaf. It's not a technical i'tikaf. The whole month of Ramadan we are forcing our ourselves to do some extra so it is potentially the best Ramadan we will ever have especially I remind myself and all of you that especially if we are under lockdown let's try to pray uh, the Qiyamul Layl or the Taraweeh or the Tahajjud prayer when it's supposed to be the ideal time which is the last third of the night we're not traveling to work most of us so maybe this Ramadan we can actually uh, make sure that we pray the Qiyam when it is the most appropriate time to pray even though it's allowed to pray earlier but uh, the ideal time and the most Barakah time is the last third of the night perhaps this Ramadan all of us can try to do that to come closer uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Dr. Saad, this is the end of our program. I hope it's not the last time we're able to do this. There were some minor technical glitches, but inshallah we'll figure out how to make it even better. Inshallah. And I hope that inshallah it was a benefit. Jazakumullah khair for spending an entire uh, hour of your time. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect you and your family and your loved 
loved ones and to protect all of us during this time. Ask Allah to increase the both of us and all of those calling to Islam and all of us worshipping Allah in our ikhlas, in our barakah, in our hidayah, in our sadad. I ask Allah to keep our hearts united in this time where enemies are trying to disunite, enemies are trying to bring chaos and whatnot. I ask Allah to keep all of our hearts united Amen. as one ummah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we live as good Muslims, that we die as righteous mu'mins and that we are resurrected in the company of the uh, anbiya and the salihin and shuhada and what a great companionship they are. Jazakumullah khair Dr. Shab, inshallah. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, this is your brother Imran Chaudhary. I am the president of East Plain Islamic Center. On behalf of EPIC Board, our scholarship, and above all, our EPIC community, I want to sincerely thank Dr. Zakir Naik for such a beautiful program. This was his first time, but I can assure you this will not be his last time. Inshallah, we will have many, many programs in the future with Dr. Zakir Naik. Last but not the least, I want to thank our beloved resident scholar, Dr. Yasser Khadi, for arranging the program, for hosting the program, and inshallah, we are looking forward to having many such programs in the future with Dr. Zakir Naik and with Dr. Yasser Khadi. Jazakumullah khair, inshallah, see you soon. Assalamu alaikum. شهر رمضان الذي أنزل فيه القرآن هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليصم وَمَنْ كَانَ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِّنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمُ الْيُسْرَ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمُ الْعُسْرَ وَلِتُكْمِلُوا الْعِدَّةَ وَلِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ وَلَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ